Hey, church family, happy Sabbath from Denise, Katie, and Todd. We hope everybody's having a great Sabbath day, and uh, you've listened to a lot of good preaching, and you studied your Sabbath school lesson, and just kind of resting from, I'm sure, a, a big week for everybody. Uh, Denise and I want to remind everybody, means you don't have a bulletin hold, holding in your hands, uh, she likes to remind everybody that uh, tomorrow when you get up on Sunday, uh, we will fall back, and so you're going to get an extra hour of sleep in theory. Uh, and so don't forget to set your clocks back an hour whenever you wake up or before you go to bed. So uh, you'll be on time Monday morning for school and for work and all those things. You won't be showing up an hour early. Uh, also, I want to remind everybody to continue to play, pray for Elena uh, as she is in Zambia, uh, her and all of her missionary team. And so uh, be with them in your prayers. And also we want to lift up Harry Figueroa Jr. That Getting a little closer now to the end. I think he was there for a couple of months, and so he should be getting fairly close to finishing up his basic training in the armed services. He's a uh, proud member of the Army, and so I know that Harry and Melissa uh, would appreciate you praying for him as he's getting ready to finish up and be with all of the uh, uh, young men and women that are in his squad or platoon, whatever that's it's termed, that they'll just all be healthy, safe, and and that uh, God will get them all through this basic, and then they'll be sent off to their different uh, specialty training. So just continue to lift up Harry Jr. and Miss Elena. Also, I want to encourage everyone to tune in Tuesday nights. Uh, Miss Denise sends out a reminder, um, and uh, prayer meeting is going so good. Pastor Carl is just, he's unfolding Matthew to us, and uh, last Tuesday night was especially good. And so um, he, I believe uh, he is in about the middle halfway part of Matthew 24. So if you can, 7 o'clock, uh, zoom it in. Uh, you can watch, you can listen on your phone or your device. And so um, if you have trouble connecting, just give uh, Miss Denise or myself a shout or Pastor Carl, and uh, we'll do our best to try to guide you onto that program. Um, also, uh, we just want to remind everybody to keep... Uh, Darlene and Velma in prayer as they continue to recover from their surgeries from last week. And so uh, we just pray that, that they're all doing well. And just remind uh, everybody to lift our district up in prayer, um, both churches, Grace Works, the school and the camp, and uh, be sure to lift up the Loiker pastoral team. And um, as a reminder also, Jennings Lake is open. Uh, we have church services only right now. Uh, at 11 a.m. every Sabbath, uh, and uh, lasts about an hour from 11 to 12. And um, uh, Ms. Denise sends out a little uh, reminder about getting head counts so our deacons can make sure that we've got plenty of social distancing seating available. So um, if you plan on trying to come, uh, please respond to those emails. That's very helpful. And so with that, uh, we're going to start off with number 71 in our books, He's Able. Mm -hmm. song. I picked that out because it's going to go with the uh, little sermonette today. And so uh, we, will, we will read once again as a reminder that, that God, uh, Jesus, uh, through the Holy Spirit, uh, are definitely most able. All right, we're going to do a little bit of an old Pathfinder song that I think most everyone knows, and it's a kind of an energetic one. Give me your Sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna to 
the king of kings, why don't you sing? Hosanna, sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna to the king. Make me a fisher of men, make me a fisher of men. try to do one. This is one of Miss Christie's favorites that she likes in our book. And so we'll do uh, The Old Rugged Cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame And I I know that sounded great in y'all's homes, and we appreciate you singing along with Denise and I. So today, if you want to get your Bibles out, uh, or bring your phones up, or your computers, whatever you have, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, and with our Bibles open, we're going to go ahead and have our opening prayer. Father God, we thank you for the blessings of the past week. Lord, for the safety, Lord, for the weather, just how your hand is over all of us, and Lord, we just ask that you'll comfort and be with anybody that's been not feeling quite well, anybody that might be sick, anybody that's recovering from surgery, all of our young people in school, Lord, all the educational needs, we ask for blessings. And Lord, we just ask that you'll continue to lift up our pastor and his wife and their family in our district. And Lord, just to guide the Florida Conference and all the conferences nation and worldwide. Lord, as we open your word, we pray for the outpouring and revealing of Jesus through the Holy Spirit in his name. Amen. All right. So, before we get going with some scripture, I want to read you something that will kind of set the, the tone for this. Um, I, I read a little bit of an excerpt from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8, and I believe it was Southern Tidings that the editor brought out. I got it in the mail, I think, about a week ago. And for some reason, what I read it reminded me, for some reason, of Winston Churchill's famous speech. And so I'm, I'm going to read that speech to you now. Um, just a little bit of background, and I want to glance at my notes real quick so I don't get any of these dates wrong. But Winston Churchill, 
became prime minister, I believe, in 1940 for the first time. He served as prime minister on two different uh, occasions from, I think, 40 to 45 and then in the 50s. Uh, and but he was one of the most powerful and most famous famous of all of Britain's prime ministers, and he, one of the most famous that he gave was called "We Shall Fight," and it says on June fourth of nineteen forty, France had fallen. On June sixteenth, nineteen forty, the British suddenly found themselves standing all alone. In all of Europe, they're on their own little island, literally, so to speak, because all of their allies have been conquered by the German foe. So Hitler and his Nazi party, they're sweeping across Europe. They are conquering all those different countries. And so France has now fallen. And so Britain very much is on their own. Now, remember, the United States has not officially gotten into this war yet. And so Britain is, is right now there they are feeling all of the brunt of the the German uh, uh, army, and air force, and naval. And so they are getting ready to brace themselves. And so Churchill's going to remind them. He's going to try to buck them up. And so it says that uh, many of you probably remember, if you're a history buff like I am, the Battle of Britain. So one of, one of Hitler's plans was is that they were going to just come and they were going to try to decimate the... Uh, British uh, folks and their airstrips and their their planes and and their uh, factories and whatnot by a lot of fighter attacks, a lot of bombing raids. And so in the Battle of Britain, as you read this great history, the British RAF, the Royal Air Force, was so great. They were so adept and their Spitfires and their other planes that they had were so nimble and the pilots were so great that they were able to really hold off and, and, and decimate and do a, a big job in getting rid of some of those measure smiths that the Germans flew and some of those other fighter planes and some of those long range bombers. And so in a great battle called the Battle of Britain, Britain held off and because of this decisive victory, this thwarted Hitler's plans on physically trying to come across the English Channel and have a conquest and, and try to occupy England. And so through great odds, they, they, they fought this. But now, even though they, that they were successful in holding off a manned invasion on their soil, when I did some research, it says that um, from July to September, that the unrelenting bombing attacks called Blitzkriegs, or as the British called them, Blitzes, they started. And when we think of, of, of being onset, when we think about being pressed hard on every side that we're going to read what Brother Paul talks about us, I can't imagine as I looked in this that from September of 1940 through May of 1941, it says that almost nightly bombing raids were, were being done from Germany on British soil. And so the air raid silence would come up. The people had to live with their windows blacked out with curtains. They had to turn the lights off whenever the, the sun went down so the planes couldn't, couldn't spot targets easily. And they had to, many of them, go into bomb shelters and in the subways. And they had to do this all the time, every day, day in and day out. And as I'm thinking about that, can you imagine what a long eight-month-plus period that would have been living under constant threat of these bombs? And it wasn't just that the, the bombs that hit and exploded were bad enough because they were devastating, but there was a percentage of the bombs that as they fell, they were either duds and were just laying there in the street or in the farmland or on the side of the road, and they hadn't exploded yet, not knowing whether they are ever going to explode, or they were dropped with a delayed fuse. And so you might think that they're a, a, a dud, drop your guard, and then suddenly a huge explosion would occur. So... The English people were living with this day in and day out for eight months. They were truly hard pressed on every side. And so this is what's going to bring us into uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But before we do that, I want to set the stage by reading what uh, Churchill had said on June 4th of 1940. He gave this speech to the House of Commons, and since then it's been reproduced and publicized. But Churchill goes on to say, he says, the British Empire and the French Republic linked together in their cause and in their need will defend to the death their native soil. 
aiding each other like good comrades to the utmost of their strength. Now remember, just a few short days after he gave this speech, France falls. Even though large tracts of Europe and many old and famous states have fallen or may fall into the grip of, of, of the Gestapo and all the odious apparatus of Nazi rule, we shall not flag or fail. He goes on to say, we shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And even if, which I do not for a moment believe, this island or a large part of it were be subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, all the different territories that Great Britain ruled, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until, in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and mighty, steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. Churchill is rallying his troops. He's, he's telling his comrades in the House of Commons that we've got some troubling times coming. There's going to be a fight coming to us. And, and even though we are, are few in allies right now, we need to buck ourselves up and that we're going to fight. As, as you read, he says, we're going to take this fight everywhere on the beaches and on the landing grounds and in the fields and in the streets and in the hills. Churchill is not shrinking back from this this daunting problem of facing all of Nazi Germany. As I thought about this and, and did some research on Great Britain and how difficult these times were, remember, you know, for quite a while, they were the, the, the main gun in this battle as the other smaller countries fell until the United States entered in on, uh, after Pearl Harbor on December 7th of 1941. And so, um, or 1940, excuse me, I think. 4041, Denise, do you remember? Mm -hmm. Anyhow, I know some of you fact checkers will, will check me. It's, it's either 1940 or 1941 that we officially, I think it's 41. But anyhow, as we turn now to uh, God's word, this reminds me of Churchill's resolve saying that we're going to fight, that we're not going to surrender, that even though we are hard pressed, we are not going to give up. And so chapter four, verse one says, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. Now, remember this setting, Paul in second Corinthians, he is, has heard that there's some trouble in Corinth. There's some problems. People aren't doing what they should be doing. There's some, there's some division. And so Paul is writing this letter to, to, to pull them up, to kind of strengthen them up in this, in these troubling times. And so he says, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now he's going to address that some people are, are talking about making reference to that. Remember that when Moses had come down from seeing God, his face had to be veiled some because of the, the brightness of it. And so there was some some uh, folks stirring up trouble and they were saying that maybe Paul wasn't really being honest and truthful and that maybe he he was being a deceitful so Paul he is addressing that here and it says but even if our gospel is veiled it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God now in your Bible the God should be of little G because it's not talking about our God about Jesus it's talking about the God of this world it's talking about Satan of this age has blinded. So he's saying Satan has blinded these men who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. He goes on in verse five and says, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your bond service for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So Paul starts off, he is addressing some of his, his accusers, those who are, are going against him. And now verse seven starts off the, the key point for me anyhow on this chapter. It says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Paul's talking about him. He's talking about us. We are these, these fragile, these earthen vessels. When I looked up earthen vessels, it's talking about 
things that 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 hold things, but they're but they're made from this earth. They are they are fragile. So Paul's saying we've got this treasure. We've we've got God's light, God's experience. Jesus wants us to get this message out, but it's coming through these fragile earthen vessels, these these earthly bodies. He says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So Paul is reminding them once again that what we're preaching, what I'm doing, what Paul's doing, that this isn't coming from Paul. This isn't coming from us, from his apostles. It's coming from God and God alone, that we're just these, these broken, humble, earthy, earthen vessels. And now it says, we are hard pressed on every side. Anybody right now feeling hard pressed? I just shared with you what Winston Churchill was was trying to to buck up his comrades, saying that we've got problems coming. England back then was certainly hard pressed that they were facing this this seeming uh, seemingly unsurmountable enemy in in Nazi Germany. This huge army uh, and all its its navy and its submarines and its air power and all the sheer manpower. And the military strength was moving towards them slowly, conquering uh, country after country. They were definitely hard pressed. I can tell you that that I certainly, from times, I feel myself hard pressed, and I'm sure that many of you out there do have gone through different things in your in your lives, in your personal lives, your family, your job, your school, your finances, your health, whatever the case is, that you have felt this hard pressed. Yet Paul says, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. You know, when I've read these passages, I can't help but almost read it in my mind with a British accent. I can almost hear Winston Churchill reading from Paul's words saying, yes, we are hard pressed. We are hard pressed, but not in despair. We are uh, persecuted, but not forsaken. Isn't, isn't that a wonderful encouragement that Paul is saying, yes, we've got troubles. He had troubles, most definitely. A lot of his famous letters to us came from a prison cell, but yet here he is encouraging us as we're reading this in 2020 that we do have struggles. We are perplexed but that we are not forsaken, that we are carrying about us the strength and the light of Jesus Christ. He goes on and says, For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh, so then death is working in us, but life in you. Paul goes on to say, And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus. Right there talking about being raised up, Paul is referring to Jesus' resurrection and his soon and second coming to take us home. And will present us with you for all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Paul ends this little segment of this chapter talking about thanksgiving. Remember, he started off about this, that yes, that we are hard pressed, yet we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Paul gives us this great encouragement to, regardless of what you're going through, hold fast to your faith, hold fast that Jesus Christ has risen from that tomb and that he is watching over all the events right now today. He's watching over my needs in my life, my family's your families, your needs, and that very soon he's going to come back because he raised, he, he was risen from that, from that tomb. And Paul wants to remind us about being in thanksgiving and to abound in the glory of God. I hope that if you are going through anything that, that feels uh, hard-pressed, that you are struggling, that you're looking for some answers, that you will take time to read 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and go over this Take some time today just to look over the whole book, if you have time, of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and, and, and all of Corinthians that Paul is encouraging, he's lifting up through this chapter. And so 
Uh, when the enemy presses hard, when you feel like the air raid siren, siren has been turned on and you're scrambling to get your blackout curtains in your windows and get to your bomb shelter, know that our Heavenly Father is standing right there and uh, he's going to dispatch his guardian angels around us to keep us safe and protected and in his hands, in his arms, and knowing that whatever you're going through, that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit will be right there going through it with you. Denise and I and Katie want to wish you a, a blessed rest of your Sabbath. We hope you guys have a great day, a great rest of your weekend. Don't remember to set your clocks back, and we hope you have a blessed weekend and a great week. Take care. We love everybody. Bye.